Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So in today's video, I'm going to be doing something that is a little bit left field. I wouldn't say it's taboo or anything like that, but it's just a little bit left field. And uh, the reason it's left field is because Jungians, whether they're of a classical variety, a classical Jungian perspective, or a kind of neo-Jungian perspective or post-Jungian perspective, tend to all have some level of consensus, let's say, or it's kind of semi-ubiquitous in uh, Jungian groups, that behaviorism isn't, let's say, the best thing or anything like that. And the fundamental reason why that is, is because behaviorism is very objective and very extroverted, and Jungian psychology, as I've talked about in the past, is very subjective and introverted. And uh, so a lot of shadow projection goes on to behaviorism from a Jungian perspective. And that comes into kind of um, not necessarily um, the, the shadow that Jungian psychology casts, as it's been talked about before, but more so it's just implicit within, let's say, the, the, the personal shadow of certain Jungians um, uh, to project that and to kind of um, have that out there, let's say. Now, I've always been a little bit of an oddity because um, I've been such a kind of thinker, an introverted thinker, that uh, I tend to quite like behaviorism in certain ways and I despise it in other ways as well um, but what I'm going to talk about is this kind of unification of the Jungian perspective with the behaviorist perspective and we do have some things to kind of reconcile here um, mainly the idea of tabula rasa the brain being a blank slate because, of course, in the behaviorist view, the brain is a blank slate. In the Jungian view, the, the brain is differentiated and it's, uh, it's kind of um, neurology, let's say. It's neuroanatomy is actually differentiated in the womb as it's growing. And then when it comes out, um, when, of course, someone is born, they have a certain neurological predisposition to certain attitudes, etc., that then allow them um, to, of course, adapt to their environment over time in an individual manner um, based on their particular um, personalized version, let's say, of the arrangement of archetypes. And, and that then obviously helps them go on to individuation and become who they are as an individual differentiated from, let's say, um, any one particular kind of collective form or collective archetypal form, uh, the pinnacle of individuation is to differentiate yourself as much as possible and as individually as possible away from, let's say, um, just uh, mere archetypes and more towards a kind of new version of a personalized archetypal form or personalized hyphen archetypal form. Uh, and that could be um, maybe associated with a particular archetype, for example, like the trickster archetype or like um, uh, the creator or something like that, you know, in the, in the case of an artist or in the case of a musician or something like that. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it's an individual and holistic representation of that. And uh, of course, I've chatted before why uh, Jung talked about this idea of uh, normality being the ultimate aim of the unsuccessful and why um, essentially being a, uh, a very individual person with an individual character, with a, with a kind of individual expression on reality um, uh, is, is of much more worth than, let's say, uh, just following that herd instinct, that, that crowd psychology of, uh, of being a social being and being uh, in the confines, being held in the confines of a certain 
um, social kind of norm, let's say, that's easy to follow because, of course, when you're in the group, when you're in the crowd, when you're, when you're in that particular social group, whatever it may be, it's very, very easy to just get caught up in the archetypes and just kind of get caught up in the, the milieu, the environment um, of, of just just being uh, and living out um, a kind of unconscious, um, personal, yet very, very archetypally dominated life. Um, so behaviorism. So first off, how do we reconcile tabula rasa with differentiated brain? There's no way we can do that. It's it's going to be either one or the other, basically. So what we need to say is we need to say which is the most likely it's going to be. And from in my personal view, from looking at literature on this, um, from all the information we have to hand in psychology at the moment, it seems more likely that the brain is differentiated from birth with certain um, kind of aptitudes, certain kind of um, attributes to it that that allow it to kind of um, integrate with an environment in a certain way. And that, of course, brings rise to the personality traits and things like this and, and, and the ways in which we... Um, differ in in cognitive schemas in schemas on the world and that's to say in the way in which we view the world um and and this is seen very obviously in, in the, the way a mathematician views the world might be very different to where uh, to, to how an artist views the world who's never really been been interested in maths of course there might actually be some overlap there possibly there is and, and possibly there are um overlaps between art and mathematics in the way in which people view uh, the world but those kind of differentiated attitudes um, can also be very different and this comes from of course different genetic components and different genetic predispositions that then um, allow an ease of access to a certain um, a certain way of life or a certain um, kind of accumulation of knowledge in a certain way of, uh, of gaining knowledge. Now, of course, what we get and what we see in super geniuses or people who are incredibly intelligent is we get uh, generally something that uh, overlaps more with more fields. And this is explained, uh, of course, by trait op the openness experience trait. And, and that, if you're really, really high in openness to experience, or let's say if you are a genius, you're going to be really, really high in openness to experience. And that means that there's going to be a lot more overlap with regards to your um, schema on reality and what you can kind of draw into that with regards to, to different subjects and therefore obviously have a more holistic view and a more open view of all of the different phenomena in the world, in the universe, whatever. And uh, uh, and that is definitely part genetic. That is not um, solely environmental or anything like that. So even by the fact that some of these things are part genetic, um, we have the idea that the brain can't be simply tabula rasa. Now, of course, there's all different um, other ideas that could lend itself to, to the ba brain not being uh, simply tabula rasa, um, the differences in brain structure, for example, the fact that um, every brain that comes out of a, a womb is unique and there are differences to brain structure. There's some people have a, a larger prefrontal cortex or larger amygdala or whatever it may be. And that, that actually uh, kind of colours itself subjectively um, by more more emotionality or a uh, predisposition to, to more abstract thought or whatever it may be and of course implicit within that emotion emotionality maybe uh, some more neuroticism or some more negative emotionality in terms of anxiety and more you're more predisposed to anxiety so it seems more likely to me that uh, the brain is differentiated at birth 
Now, I'm not saying the argument for Tabula Rasa is out. I, d I don't think it is out completely, even though, in my view, I'd, I'd like to be, I'd like to say that quite dominantly. But I don't think it should be said dominantly. I don't think anything should ever be uh, ruled out. I think that's, I think that's one of those kind of pseudo intellectual stances that that is quite egoic in a manner. Which it, it's, it's a formulation of the ego. It, it's kind of a, someone wanting to say, well, I've got this proof. For this X, Y, and Z, so now it's out. The other person's out, or the other thing is out. You see that that all that is is projection. All that is is that's that's um, it, it's kind of like a, an arrogance as well because we've got certain X, Y, and Z proof, so it's out. But as we know from Kantian philosophy, or um, even from philosophic doubt, um, nothing can ever really be out. Nothing can ever be really fully out, you know, gone, done. It's exactly this way um, because we never know what's around the corner. And that's that's a, a very colloquial uh, phrase that actually sums up parts of um, Kant's transcendental philosophy in a very succinct and um, easy to follow manner. And uh, it's true. We can't know what's around the corner. So we don't know. Um, for sure any of these things but what I would say is that it's probably more that way than that way and so if we are to attempt to unify two fields like behaviorism or Jungian psychology we have to say it's this way or that way just for purposes of being able to unify these two fields but of course we don't want to just say that based on no research or based on no um, scientific evidence for it being one way or the other. So I'm basing that kind of um, decision off what I can see uh, is possibly the, the more correct way of looking at the brain as a structure. And of course, all of our work, all of the things that we do is coloured by our subjective schemas and our subjective views on the world. And so me making a, a, a decision like that is, is little different to, let's say, doing an objective scientific study or doing a number of ob objective scientific studies and then making a kind of estimation based on the statistics we've been presented with from the results from those scientific studies. Because ultimately, uh, these kind of things always have to be someone's judgment. They always have to be um, uh, when someone says... Uh, after a num doing a number of objective, rigorous scientific studies, it has to be someone who says, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna take that as as about right." And Alan Watts talks about that quite extensively. And uh, when I first heard him talk about that, and 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 revisited it as well numerous times, it was a revelation for me because it made me understand that basically all of our uh, scientific uh, elucidation of the world is really a, a a distinction in the sense of we've we've had to say at some point yeah okay we're going to accept that but you see when is the point that it's right to accept that we never know is the point of accepting that um the heart functions in this specific way um, and, and we can be dogmatically correct about it, is that point after doing a thousand operations and after doing a thousand different studies on the heart? Or is it after doing ten different studies on the heart, ten operations? Obviously, you'd imagine the more data we have, the more easy it is to understand that, that is the correct way and that's the correct information we're gaining, and that is, of course, true. But nonetheless... There's always that next study, there's always that next operation, there's always that next thing that could actually reveal something new that knocks off something old. And uh, that's seen a lot like in health, uh, in healthcare, and it's seen a lot in psychology as well with, with different studies and stuff, especially these days where older studies from you know the 30s or 40s and things like that, even the 50s and 60s, 
are being knocked off and being replaced and being refined and being changed and and, uh, and being thought about more objectively and and then being able to to be refined because of that and 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 that's very very interesting so nonetheless what i'm doing is i'm making a subjective distinction and i'm saying that it's more that way so we've kind of got over that problem uh based on the information that we have to hand and the information that seems likely. So we're making a, a, a kind of likely estimation that it is that from the information we have. Now, I wanted to talk about as well a quote from Skinner, and I believe it was from Freedom and Dignity um, in the 50s. And it's a very, very weird quote because it says... Um, Emotions are examples are the greatest of the greatest examples of uh, the fictional causes we so readily attribute behaviour to. Now I'm paraphrasing slightly there, but that's the the essential basis of the quote, and um, it intrigued me massively. This quote because I respected Skinner um, on the basis of watching an interview with him one time. And of course, I'd learned about him in, in behaviorism in, in my degree anyway. And uh, I'm also doing behaviorism again this year at the current time of filming this. Uh, and so, you know, I've had plenty of lectures at this point on behaviorism as well. But I read, I, I watched that interview and um, I was struck by a man who doesn't seem to leave any stone unturned. And so when I read that quote, I thought, well, I'm not having this. I'm not just um, putting that to bed. Because my lecturers, who uh, one of whom, or two of whom really, are very, very intelligent men. They are not at all um, people who um, are, are merely playing at, at scholarly life or, or psychological um, studies or anything like that. They are incredibly intelligent but nonetheless, they disagreed quite readily with that quote. Now, I'm not like that because um, I don't think intelligence should be um, or should have prejudice. I think that that's a formulation of premature negativity or premature negative emotionality towards something that you have a personal prejudice against. So those people who taught that, that lecture, for example, were uh, neuroscientists. So you see where we're getting here. Introverted, mainly feeling types, whereas behaviorism's objective you know, it's it's very, as I've said, it's very rigorous, it's very, and even extroverted to a degree as well, behaviorism is. So, of course, quite naturally, if you're a neuroscientist who's introverted and, and more towards the feeling end, end of things, which is often the case, um, you're going to quite naturally just disagree with that quote straight away. Especially if you're into effective neuroscience or anything like that that deals with the, the emotions more. And um, so I thought, you know, I, I agree with the fact that they disagree. I do agree with that, actually. But let me have a look at this bloody thing, because I will not submit. I will not say, well, OK, that's that. You know, I don't like doing that. And the reason and the other reason I don't like doing that is because of an Albert Einstein quote. Einstein said, um, I think about problems longer than other people. Um, he stays on problems longer than other people. So I've always taken that since I read that, um, probably, I don't know, a year or two ago now. Um, I'm, I'm going to stay on bloody problems. I'm going to think about this stuff a lot because that's the route to really superior understanding. And the route to kind of inferior understanding is... Um, through not being conscientious with the intellect, making sure that you have every stone turned over, that's the way to superior understanding. What inferior understanding does is projects its own ideas and fears and all the rest of it and prejudices at all of these different stones and, said, and says, 
oh, I'll turn this stone over, but in fact, I won't look at the rest. I'll just satisfy myself with that one stone being turned over and hope that I'm right. That that won't do. So, um, I thought, well, you know, let's think of it. So, emotions are great examples of the fictional causes we so often attribute behavior to. But I think to myself, yeah, but emotions have a reality. They're not fictional. Imagine this is a drywall here, right? And imagine I get really angry. I'm, I'm in a really angry mood. And I punch that drywall right through. You're telling me that anger is fictional when I've just punched a bloody drywall and you can see a hole there. And that hole is an objective reality in the real world. And you're telling me that's fictional. Well, it can't be fictional. I'm sorry, it can't be fictional. But I started to think, and I started to have a lot of trouble thinking, <laughs> because that's the, what, you, what you have when you start thinking. And I got a little bit of a glimpse, and I managed to kind of muddle my way through and just about see certain things. And the way I got there was making an analogy and, and you see we all come to the the kind of the same clearing, the same clearing ground let's say, um, as the people who created these quotes, but we, we all get there in different ways. So Skinner will have got to that quote in a from a very different pathway than I got to this quote. But nonetheless, we've both got to a similar sort of clearing, you know, a similar sort of end goal, let's say. I mean, he wouldn't have used the analogy of, of neurophysiology, for example, that I'm going to use. But imagine that you've got objective chemical reactions in the brain, you have an action potential in a neuron uh, between sodium and potassium, of course, and that is an objective chemical reaction. And that chemical reaction goes to create a movement. For example, there's neural pathways firing in my motor cortex right now for me to be able to move my hand up and down. Very objective, right? Okay, fair enough. So I thought to myself, hang on a minute, this is what he means. The emotions, he's saying that the emotions as he puts it, are epiphenomenon. The emotions are epiphenomenon because they're, they're, they're just a causal um, phenomenon as related to this actually objective, fundamentally objective thing um, that goes on. You know, obviously with my example in the brain, with the chemical reaction. And, and so it's not that uh, the emotions have anything to do with... Um, uh, behavior or, or actually impact behavior but actually they're just this epiphenomenon and it's actually the kind of objective causality that's running along um, that, that actually is the behavior and I thought okay well that's bloody pretty interesting you know that's actually quite cool but it's not right you see and and, and so I started to think well what Skinner st seems to be doing is he seems to not understand that the objective causal relationships or the, the neural pathways in the brain, let's say, and the, the action potentials in the brain arise mutually with the behavior itself. So what I'm saying, and we are getting into territory that's a little bit hard to understand, but I'm going to try and um, do this very simply. So, the emotions, the subjective, and the objective are one thing, in, like in Spinoza's dual aspect monism. Now, don't worry about that. It doesn't mean anything fancy. It just means that, um, basically, the objective brain that you can dissect and you can look at is the exact same thing as the subjective consciousness I'm experiencing now. That's one way of giving an example of what Spinoza's dual aspect monism is. And um, so when I go up like that and get angry and I go, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. That is the objective. Of course, the objective chemical reactions in my brain, but also the emotion simultaneously. The behavior and the emotion are bound to one another. They are merged. They are like... Um, uh, imagine you... Uh, mix two things that cannot be unmixed. You you literally mix two chemicals together and they merge and you cannot separate them. That's what it really is. The the behavior, the objective behavior and the subjective affect are one thing. That's where Skinner got it wrong. And that was that's within the, the dual aspect monism. And that's what we we learn well, we learned about that subjective, the dual aspect monism in the lecture. It wasn't at all paired with that behaviourist quote, by the way. It was just uh, another part of the lecture. But nonetheless, using that and being able to think about that, I've managed to understand certain aspects of what Skinner meant and also what is probably about right. And so if that's the case, then what do we have? We have uh, a system that is mutually arising, let's say, and that is inclusive of both objective and subjective thinking and feeling, whatever, you know, you, uh, uh, you could say it in those terms. So then, if behaviorism is an incredibly objective thing, and let's say Jungian psychology with all of its mysticism and uh, art therapy and all that sort of stuff and, and religion and spirituality and a uh, real kind of um, subjective flowering of the personality through experience and all that sort of stuff. Then clearly we've got a yin and yang thing going on here. It's not hard to tell. So then you think, well, you've got to unify these fields. So let's say that we've taken this idea of the brain being differentiated and we have uh, rejected to some degree, or at least in this, in this framework, we've rejected the tabula rasa idea. Then what we get is we need to explore the behavioral portion of this in uh, life. So... Skinner talks about in an interview, which is a really good example of an artist and how the artist um, will kind of create a positive um, or a positively reinforced behavior chain throughout creating a piece of art. So the artist will put a dab of paint on the canvas and that will reinforce positively the the putting more paint on the canvas until the overall artwork is done and then let's say they're happy with it for example um, then they think oh yeah that's good all the rest of it they get a positive reinforcement from that and they go on to do more artwork now imagine we've got this genetic basis this genomic basis this neurobiological basis of personality which says from a young view you're going to be an artist, okay, from, from that genetic basis. Now, uh, we put that person, obviously when they're born, they become in an, in an environment. And let's say at some point they find out about art. Then the art, obviously, the behavioral manifestations of this, they see the art, they are, become positively reinforced by it, and then they go around in those cycles and there's all sorts of different behavioral phenomenon going on um, with regards to you know punishment and reinforcement and all these different things that that happen and and this would be uh, archetypal reinforcement because what we would have is we'd have a certain archetypal form uh, that becomes positively reinforced over that time period which then leads them um, to to actually flowering as that individuality um, from their genetic basis but within the confines of, of uh, a behavioral framework or you could put it within a behavioral framework and uh, when things go wrong with the personality for example when people are neurotic or anything like that 
then this can all come into a behavioral framework as well because let's say that person has an over reinforcement of um, the child archetype for example then what we need to do is we need to reinforce them uh, into another line of being which would be the hero archetype which would be a particular part of the animus to a degree and that would be an overcoming of their uh, childhood into adulthood and the way in which you do that is by exposure therapy behavioral shaping things like that to be able to reinforce them into a new position of um, being able to integrate their personality more holistically because of um, uh, the ability of that archetypal reinforcement producing a um, basically uh, well it's an entheodromian shift that that allows them to continue their individuation and and overcome their neurosis um, but that's all done in a sense by or including behavioral techniques or within a behavioral framework even if you're talking about it like that or not talking about that it like that that's what happens and uh, and then of course they reinforce more holistically the archetype or the, the experience of life that aligns um, with their particular personal myth um, in the sense of um, whatever that may be being a musician, being an artist, being uh, a mathematician, being what, whatever it is, you know, a philosopher, this, that, whatever. Anyway, so um, that then allows us to see that and then overcome these things and um and behaviorism as a therapy in conjunction with jungian psychology and, and dream analysis uh behaviorism bringing to the table things like behavioral shaping exposure therapy stuff like that jungian psychology bringing bring to the table dream analysis archetypal um i was going to say patterns but it's not particularly the right phrase but archetypal um elements let's say in your psyche that are working positively or negatively these two as a union to push forward um are actually very very superior if of course we look at it from a perspective of the genetic and the socialized and this also brings together the nature and nurture debate as well because it means that um uh, we've got that socialization there that everyone bangs on about is is of course a factor um, but we've also got the genetic basis now of course the more you go into um, archetypal reinforcement or um, this kind of field of archetypal behaviorism the more you'll realize that the uh, just as within more of a Jungian view the archetypes are reinforced socially and therefore everything does come from a genetic basis anyway it's just that once everything's come out into the environment um, what happens is the instincts or the archetypes are reinforced in various different ways or more accurately the instincts and archetypes reinforce themselves um, through the environment and through interactions with the environment um, in let's say um, a socialized manner you could put it like that and um, so that means really that it is all nature it's not nurture but there is a suit what I've what I've termed before superficial socialization um, which occurs which can be quantified and which can be utilized in a behavioral manner um, even in a manner that, that um, you could literally look at it as as it being tabula rasa you know you could look at it in that way from a theory you could create a theory around that and uh, uh, it still work particularly well because it's uh, in the environment anyway you know the the applications of that theory are only ever going to be within the environment we're not going to be outside of the environment because the environment is all we know so um therefore that that would would still function and that's why behaviorism does still function because um even though it, it takes on board these specific things um like tabula rasa um it can still function as a theory within um the interplaying of the archetypes now um the problem 
and this is why it falls down, is because of the instincts, is because of things like spirit, um, which behaviorism doesn't account for. You see, in a behavioral view, it, it would be that everyone possesses the same level of spirit. But yet we know that that's not true. We know that certain people have seemingly have a more voracious spirit than others. That's to say they, they have more perseverance, more resilience, more, more courage, less, less anxiety. Uh, and, and that's, of course, from their differentiated brain. Um, and so if we unify these two, place them together in this, this whole, we get the best of both worlds. We get these two things that are so intensely kind of, uh, that they're so kind of bubbling with intensity, they're, they're almost clashing to the, the, that degree of intensity, but nonetheless, there, there can be a harmony there uh, if you structure things in the correct way. And if you... Um, invest these principles of behaviorism into Jungian psychology in the confines of um, therapy in the correct way. If you do it in uh, the incorrect way, then it, obviously it's not going to work. Because if you do anything in the incorrect way, it's not going to be very effective. But if you do it in the correct way, it will, it will work and it will cement itself. So behaviorism does have a lot to give uh, Jungian psychology and it has a lot to offer um, the individuation of an individual and the, the ability for that individual to actually integrate as a differentiated personality in the environment through the reinforcement techniques, the behavioral shaping, the, the um, exposure as well, things like that in unison with the, with the uh, Jungian techniques. And um, that has a lot of exciting possibility for practical application. And indeed, it is uh, um, applied practically now with some clinical psychologists or um, certain kind of um, therapists and stuff like that. And even within a behavior, even a behavior analyst is practicing archetypal behaviorism without even knowing it because the archetypes are at work implicit within that. Um, so they may be behaviorally reinforcing someone, but nonetheless, what they're doing is, or, or what they're working with is um, archetypal situations, archetypes, etc. even though the behaviorist wouldn't know it. Um, and that's really the reason as well that we need to train people not in this kind of dogmatic kind of well, I'm going to down, go down this one specialist field or I'm going to learn superficially about one subject and not about others, which is normally how it's taught in university. For example, in a university degree, you'll do one module on one particular psychology and it'll be in some depth, but not in, not in great depth. And uh, unless you may be talking about biological psychology, there's a bit more depth in that. Um, but what we need to do is we need to create individuals who, is going to, who are going to go away independently, and everyone knows this anyway, but go away independently and research all areas of, let's say, for example, taking psychology, all areas of psychology and get to a proficient understanding of all of them so that then they aren't being prejudiced to other areas of psychology or uh, aren't... Um, aren't unaware, that's the more dangerous thing, aren't unaware of the different principles in other aspects of psychology, because if they're unaware, they don't know what they're doing, they're unconscious. Um, it's just like being, well, it's not just like being unconscious of a complex, but it's, uh, there's similarities in a sense, um, although it's not the exact same phenomenon or anything like that. But, um, if, let's say, I am aware of behavioral attitudes, if I'm aware of Jungian psychology, if I'm aware of neurobiology, if I'm aware of uh, social psychology, if I'm aware of all these different things, I can see the harmony of all these fields working together as an integrated system um, that has been defined in different ways on the phenomenon of reality. 
behaviorist term things in their terms but they're exactly the same as some things in Jungian psychology and Jungian psychology terms things in their ways but they're exactly the same as certain things in neurobiology etc etc and so if I or, or if let's say we create individuals who are going to be aware of all of these fields to a fair degree then what those individuals can do is um, unify these things into a superior psychology um, that allows for a more integrated understanding and when that psychology comes about people can come forward over the next generations and then unify that into another psychology or unify different aspects of other psychologies into uh, another superior psychology then let's say we have two or three forms of psychology that are integrated forms that are incredibly complex but nonetheless are incredibly efficient way more efficient than we have now with all these different fields trying to counteract each other and saying things in different ways but that are the same phenomena and all that we have these two psychologies and then we unify them then we get a better and better understanding it's like in physics with unifying different theories throughout the centuries and becoming closer to some sort of unified theory uh, like a grand unified field theory or something like that what they're trying to do in physics and quite rightly too because they're the most intelligent people anyway psychi basically I've understood that there's three types of most intelligent people on the planet there's physicists there's independent geniuses people like Elon Musk or Nikola Tesla or something like that and then there's the Jungian psychiatrists. They're the three types of people. And I say Jungian psychiatrists, and I've mentioned this before, but they're the three types of people that are um, the most intelligent. Um, mainly because of their trait openness. Mainly because of how goddamn high those people are in trait openness and how much breadth of knowledge those people have. You, ask, you, you go to any Jungian psycho psychiatrist and they... I've got a medical de degree for one, so they know all about the body. They know tons about psychology. They know about mythology. They know about religion, spirituality. They know about possibly zoology and things like that, or uh, enophology or something it's called as well. Um, all these different things they know about history because they've really like got this incredible knowledge base. And um, by being, and it's partly by being a Jungian as well that and being. Uh, introduced to Jung's works because when you read Jung it uh, well um, Messilia Iliad said um, when he was with Jung uh, it was one of the highlights of his life to ever meet Jung but he said um, when you're with a man like Jung your thoughts just seem to tower you just seem to have incredibly intellectual thoughts and it's similar when you read Jung. If you read Jung for long, long enough, you become someone who is uh, very sharp intellectually. Someone who is, you know, precise, is knows about things, understands, is very, very meticulous as well in trying to get things right. And uh, and so those particular people really do understand and really do have a, a, a central understanding of certain um, fields and, and certain ideas that other people do not have a grasp on in other fields for example and I mean you could draw into this um, as I have done there with like as I've termed it the independent geniuses like people like Elon Musk or Nikola Tesla uh, you could draw into that like engineers and things, you know, like top tier engineers. I'm talking not not like just any old engineer, but I mean in top 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 dogs of engineering, they can come into that as well. Um, but um, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to do in philosophy, in psychology, in wherever really. Uh, there's certain fields. It might not work in that great, but certainly in in particular fields, it, it's necessary and, and it and it would work quite well. Um, and the two fields really that that are quite good at doing this will be behaviorism and Jungian psychology, because implicit within Jungian psychology, you can fit 
all the different psychologies anyway. You can fit neurobiology, you can fit um, uh, social psychology quite easily, you can fit behaviorism, uh, you can fit personality psychology, all these different things, you know, you name it, you can fit it within Jungian psychology. And so unifying behaviorism with Jungian psychology to create this kind of um, archetypal behaviorism uh, that then kind of unifies these two psychologies that are, are opposing allows for an even greater holistic understanding of psychology because then what you can do going forward is you can uh, identify using archetypal behaviorism the archetypal relationships with uh, in unison with the behavioral phenomenon and you can explain them kind of vice versa in a sense and then that can be a theory that can be applied to other areas of psychology such as um, trying to understand the phenomena in social psychology um, and other you know various different areas of psychology and that's quite interesting from from a certain perspective and that allows us to gain um, particularly a therapeutic method that is superior because Jungian psychology lacks one thing and the thing that it really lacks is action because you can easily spend uh, tons of time interpreting your dreams and tons of time kind of just thinking about the archetypes but never really actually going out there and overcoming your fears. Behaviorism, or, or certainly like exposure therapy, and the, the things that are, the techniques that are within behaviorism can push you to do that. So you interpret your dreams, you understand the archetypes, then you put that into action with regards to um, uh, behavioral principles that allow you to get out there and to, to really get over things. And... Um, and that would be what um, a good archetypal behaviorist would do. They would go out and they would be like, right, come on, let's interpret your dreams. Let's sort, sort this out first. Let's, let's think about these archetypes and what kind of complexes you have and stuff like that. Then, after we've done that, we need to then form a direction, form a plan of how we can slowly get you out there, how we can slowly kind of uh, reinforce these positive archetypes inside of you, obviously punish the negative archetypes by way of uh, behavior and allow kind of a flowering of that individuality in a certain manner. And uh, a humanistic perspective can come into this, a Rogerian perspective can come into this with regards to um, allowing the individual to come out of themselves and to to see themselves who they really are as well um, from uh, an, an individualized kind of archetypal perspective where their kind of um, individuation lies in that manner and so you can easily fit a humanistic view into this um, and I think a humanistic view would be advantageous as well on the sidelines to you know archetypal behaviorism because it allows for that more feeling dimension still again uh, and that's and that's quite good because sometimes although i've said you know jungian psychology can be very very subjective and it is sometimes there is a tendency to actually draw too much upon that introverted think thinking function when you're looking at the archetypes rather than let's say introverted feeling or extroverted feeling and so having that that humanistic view on the sidelines of that kind of very encouraging but but not kind of encroaching upon you or overwhelming you uh, that very encouraging sense of well who you are what what is it within you that sings you know how can uh, we kind of self-actualize you how can we get you to a state of um, fulfilling all of these kind of basic needs and, and get into a state of experience that uh, you can have peak experiences, you can have these things and you can feel um, fulfilled in, in, in these needs and, and kind of have a sense of uh, what's known as bee love, um, which is a very, very complex phenomenon if you look at it in detail. And it's about a kind of non... 
uh, attachment love in a sense and it's not so much that in a kind of dogmatic zen type st uh, sense or stance it's it's more of a natural formulation of your uh, relationship with others that is very very close to the idea in Jungian psychology of differentiated feeling um, and uh, a differentiated feeling function to the peak of what it is worth and so if that comes into it if that humanistic view comes into it it allows to get rid of uh, a little bit of that introverted thinking that you can get you get trapped in with regards to the archetypes and with regards to uh, dream interpretation and with regards to kind of um, looking too objectively at your psyche um, it's good to look objectively at your psyche but you can look too objectively it can become a trap on the on the way to individuation so that can come into it as well and it can formulate a more holistic um a more holistic way of being as well uh to to quote one of the titles of roger's books um and so that's the point of archetypal behavior and that's the point of of um behaviorism and Jungian psychology together instead of one or the other and uh, it allows for a more kind of get out there attitude do things uh, and and get over things more because in the Jungian way of doing things it can be a little bit too flowery it can be at times a little bit too relaxed now, Jung knew this very, very well, and this is why Jung didn't take any, any fools, you know, he didn't suffer any fools, and he would make sure that people would get out there. Uh, he would make sure that, that if people had certain complexes, he would uh, adapt them to their environment by way of suggesting things to them for, for what they could do to, to fulfill that adaptation. Um, but nonetheless, Jung isn't around anymore, and it seems that a lot of Jungians have gone very, very in the introverted manner and less in the kind of actionable manner. And uh, so it seems that we need to reclaim a little bit of that extroverted action within Jungian psychology. And the way to do that is to pair these two together and to have a, um, a socio-emotional um role but also a task oriented role in terms of leadership styles so both of these things are, are getting expression and uh the kind of very emotional side of of therapy as i've said humanist and jungian and a very kind of um objective sense on things on um kind of uh application and 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 um Oh, what's the word? Kind of different environments that behaviour is put in and that, that they have to deal with and they have to actually uh, sort out behaviour within. Uh, they're too, they're, you know, that's objective, that's subjective and we need the two together because one of them alone is too this way or one of them alone is too that way and uh they work on their own as individual things but they work as kind of like imagine in doctor who where the doctor's only got one heart beating you know instead of both heart beat hearts beating it doesn't work you need the two beating so if you have the two beating you, you you're fine so um that's really what you need to do you need to have both the hearts beating and then you're you're up there, you're good, you're cool, and you're um, allowed to kind of, um, or you're made to develop in the in the best way possible. Not only in ter not necessarily in terms of made by a therapist, but made by your own psyche within that within that kind of confines of that route of therapy. Your psyche is pushing you towards that, is, is, is fulfilling the hero's journey through that in a very, very effective way. 
and the psyche will continue to push you through that um, and you only need to look at your dreams to ever see that um, so I'll leave it there anyway guys so thank you very much for watching and uh, I will see you in the next one so see you very soon guys mm -hmm.